Hello and welcome to the October meeting of the Southwest Hearts Astronomical Society. Uh, we're going to begin the session very shortly. Um, just going to share my screen to start with. So the talk tonight is a virtual tour of my observatory with Ian Melville and um, we'll do that very shortly but first I just want to go through tonight's agenda. First of all we'll have a few notices then we'll have a news item uh, given by Len Mann and then the main presentation with Ian Meadowville. Afterwards, we'll have a tour of the night sky, a planetarium visit and uh, Richard Westwood will host that for us. So just a few things, first of all, uh, just mentioned that we are actually recording this and I've started the recording now. Okay. Um, then, as I mentioned, the speaker view is just helpful that you can see more of the presentation without being distracted by what other people are doing on the screen. And as I mentioned about questions, use the chat button and we'll pick up the questions at the end. Now, I was hoping to have a Zoom room breakout at the end, but when I delved a little further into it, I found that it actually costs quite a lot of money to have that feature. And it was going to cost us uh, close to £500 to be able to add that feature. So I decided it wasn't really worth it. And that maybe we just can have a, a chat before and after leaving the, all the, the videos up. Uh, then after that, we're going to talk about the next meeting. And uh, the next meeting, in fact, on the 27th of November, uh, is going to be uh, by Simon Kidd. And he's going to talk about asteroid occultations. And what they are is basically when an asteroid passes in front of a star, it allows you to make uh, much more accurate measurements of the asteroid, its shape and size and so on. And you can glean a lot of data from that. So it's an unusual topic, but it actually follows on quite nicely from some of the stuff that uh, Ian will be talking about later on tonight, and he'll probably elaborate on that. So with that, I'm now going to uh, hand over to um, Len, if I just get myself organized a bit better here. Right. Hopefully everyone can see that. Um, I'll just arrange my screen. Um, <clears throat> okay, well, I, there's a, a news item about impossible objects. Um, when a, a large star collapses, it can become a supernova. And then a supernova will frequently leave behind a neutron star, or if it's very big, a black hole. <clears throat> now, neutron stars are known to have masses of up to 2.1 solar masses, but not beyond. And stellar black holes, uh, that's a black hole that starts from a collapsing star, um, not a supermassive black hole that occurs in the middle of a galaxy. So a stellar black hole normally start about five solar masses, not below. So you get a situation where there's a mass gap between 2.1 and five uh, solar masses where you don't find neutron stars or black holes, the, the mass gap as it's called. Um, yet uh, we have discovered an object of 2.6 solar masses. So that's the um, uh, first uh, impossible object. When you consider much larger stars, very much larger stars, that uh, collapse and form black holes, it is known to work up to about 80 solar masses. So if a very large star will form up to 80 solar masses, it will uh, generate a black hole. But above that, apparently, uh, the physics doesn't work because the explosion is so violent that it dissipates all the matter and you don't get a black hole behind, left behind. But that only occurs up to about 250 solar masses where the physics starts working again and um, you uh, get very large black holes, very large in terms of a stellar black hole. Um, so again, there's a mass gap of 80 to 250 solar masses uh, where they shouldn't exist. But we've discovered a black hole of 142 solar masses. So um, what's going on? Where, what are these solar masses? Okay, well, we discovered these masses in the uh, gravitational wave detectors, which uh, I'm sure most of you know about. There are, are three on Earth, two in America and one in Italy. 
And basically, they're two long uh, evacuated tunnels, and they're at right angles to each other. And a laser beam is shined in, shone into the tunnel, and it's split so that it goes equally down uh, the two tunnels simultaneously. Then they bounce up and down many, many times, and finally are combined to, together and go into a detector, which looks at the phase uh, coming in, and that the whole machine makes an interferometer. And what that means is that if one tunnel should change in length slightly from the other tunnel, you will see an output. So as Einstein predicted, if there's a ripple in space time and you get one tunnel a slightly different uh, length to the other, you should be able to detect it. Now, when uh, black holes and neutron stars merge, they create ripples in space time and uh, we can now detect them. But to be able to do that, the sensitivity of these detectors is incredible. They can detect one ten thousandth of the diameter of a proton change in distance of those two tunnels. So um, when they, uh, the two objects merge, and in this case, they don't need to merge in our galaxy, they can be virtually anywhere in the universe. We've seen mergers over a billion light years away. And uh, they will cause this ripple in space time, and we can detect it. Um, and as the two objects rotate around each other, they get faster and faster and faster before they merge. And if you take the output of the detector and put it into an audio amplifier, you can actually hear it. Let me play that for you, for one particular black hole merger. I hope you can hear this. So that, that's actually two black holes. I'll do it again. Hopefully that came out and you could hear it. Um, and uh, it's incredible, really, that we've been worked out in theory that that could happen. It seems like magic, two objects many times higher than the mass of the sun, uh, merging together, spinning around each other. We've worked it out in theory, we've measured it in practice. So it's not magic, it's actually true. <laughs> Okay, right, my last slide. This is my last slide. Um, this is a, a very interesting chart. It, well, I find it fascinating. Perhaps I'm funny that way, but I, I really do. And uh, you can see on the vertical axis, it shows the stellar mass from one up to 80 solar masses. This is a chart produced by the LIGO Virgo gravitational wave um, scientists. And uh, you can see um, a number of dots on here, some purple dots and some yellow dots, for example. The, the purple ones are black holes and the yellow ones are neutron stars. And the individual objects are called EM black holes, that's electromagnetic. What that means is we've detected them, not by gravitational waves, but by telescopes, radio telescopes, and they're almost all in our galaxy. Some are in very close by gal galaxies like the uh, large uh, Magellanic Cloud, um, but they're all local basically. And again, you can see that the neutron stars basically stop at 2.1 solar masses, and black start at five, so everything's working very nicely to theory. Um, you can see that mass gap. Then, um, <clears throat> then you can see these triplets. You see on the left here, these are results of the gravi gravitational wave detectors. So on this left-hand one, you'll see a, a star, a, a black hole rather, of uh, 20 stellar mass, mass, combining with one of just over 30, creating a new black hole, just over 40. Uh, uh, solar masses. And each one of these triplets uh, displays an actual detection that's been um, received by the gravitational wave uh, detectors. Um, so I want to draw your attention to this one here, which was last May this happened, no, last August. And it was a very unusual merger between um, a black hole of just over 20 uh, solar masses. In fact, it was 23. 
and something that was 2.6 solar masses that created this new black hole a little bit bigger than the original. And so therefore that proved that, proved that there was a, an object of 2.6 solar masses, which seems impossible. Um, but of course it is possible. You can imagine uh, a triple star system with all the stars in that big enough to create supernova, um, two of them creating uh, um, neutron stars, which then merged and created this strange object of 2.6 solar masses, which then merged with the black hole, creating this larger black hole. That's one of the theories I've seen. Um, that could have taken place in a, um, a star cluster, uh, therefore, collisions are more likely. Um, but that's the only explanation for that. Uh, and then uh, the other um, object that combined was in May last year, two black holes merged. They were just 7 uh, million light years away. One was 85 solar masses and one was 66. So that's very close to the impossible area. And they combined, it's off the top of this chart, unfortunately, and made a black hole of 142 solar masses. So, and in fact, when that merger happened, it used up five solar masses just radiating gravitational waves. So it seems that these objects that we've discovered aren't really impossible. What is impossible is that the masses we've detected would be generated from a single stellar object collapsing. So clearly, the objects that um, combine with another object once they are um, uh, black holes or neutron stars, which then take you into this range, which I've called impossible, but of course is possible by this new method. And um, I hope I've explained that properly and uh, that's the end of the news. Great, Len, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I'll give you uh, There you go, it should be, it should be all, all, all back again. Okay. And, um, I apologize to those that were caught in the waiting room for a while. I didn't realize that when I handed over host control to Len, that I then couldn't allow people in. So I've had to, to take it back and that's why there was a delay. Apologies for that. Okay, so uh, tonight's speaker is um, Ian Melville. And uh, you might know Ian because he was a committee member and a member of our society for quite a number of years, but he was a committee member between 2010 and 2013. And uh, he's got a a scientific background. He got a, a BSc in astrophysics from Cardiff University and then he went on later to UCL to do a, a BSc honours in computer science and then further a, a diploma in astronomy from UCL later on. So he's a, a very technical background I think and his day job he's a um, software engineer <laughs> so he works for a company called Seller, I think that's pronounced, uh, pronounced correctly, Ian, and they specialize in uh, marketing and exchange uh, type of transactions for the, the um, industries, including uh, trading on the, the stock exchange, I believe, as well. So he's had uh, 15 years ex of experience in that, and he's proficient in a lot of these languages, some I don't know at all. Uh, and it can handle scheduling systems. These are automated workflow processes. So I would imagine that setting up um, an observatory to do a workflow is a piece of cake for him, <laughs> but maybe not for the rest of us. So hopefully we'll learn a little bit more about that tonight. So tonight's presentation, uh, a virtual tour of my observatory is from Ian Melville, and he's going to talk us through some of the elements of that. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Ian. So just bear with me a second while I get Ian to be. I have to do this in a specific way and I'm not that proficient at doing it. I beg your pardon. That's fine. I think there it's we go. The... Make host. Am I on? You're on. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. No, a wonderful introduction. Thanks for going through my CV. Uh, in front of everybody. <laughs> that was both embarrassing and uh, uh, quite uh, uh, sort of uh, nice to hear. So I wasn't expecting that. But yes, my thank favorite you. part of the night to be able to embarrass people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Well, thanks. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us um, this evening. So, uh, yeah, as Sean mentioned, I am um, a fairly long standing member of the society. 
haven't really been attending the meetings or none of us have been attending this year but uh, last few years of course life gets busy and um, things tend to get in the way but yes I was on the committee for a few years and was helping uh, with the telescope support ma mainly at the school observatory in fact and um, setting up the computer control aspect of things there uh, trying to make things easier and and simpler you know moving the control away from the handset and towards a computer uh, which has several advantages so we'll go into some of those um, differences uh, we'll, we'll, that we'll see a bit later through the talk um, as you mentioned I am a programmer so uh, working with computers to do this sort of thing is um, somewhat easier for me I suppose a lot of you will also have experience uh, with uh, with computers uh, hopefully down as far as installing applications and configuring them uh, the the software that I am using in my observatory some of it I had to had to recompile uh, myself uh, so it does get a little bit more technical uh, if you go down the route uh, which I've gone down but it's certainly possible and there's lots of information out there to support you and people as well uh, so as Sean mentioned a little while back the chat is open so I'd encourage you to use it. If you see uh, or hear anything that you have a question about throughout the talk, just uh, either drop it into the chat or if you'd prefer, uh, you can wait until the end and, and ask a question. But it's good to put it into the chat as you see or hear something. If it's not later covered, we'll, we'll try and discuss that. So as, uh, as we'll see in a moment, we'll, we'll, we'll go out to the observatory in a, in a virtual fashion. I've pre-recorded some of this. Uh, we've actually got some building work at the house at the moment which started this week and the back garden is a complete um, no-go zone. It looks like a World War I battlefield at the moment. Uh, there's mud everywhere and there's no power to the dome. So I'm very glad that I prepared uh, in that way. So the dome itself, let's talk about that before we jump in just for a few minutes. It's a 2.1 meter all fiberglass dome. Uh, it was installed in 2006 uh, and you'll recognize from the design it's a classical shutter uh, style uh, observatory uh, which I chose for several reasons uh, so light pollution being the main one in that um, uh, the, the alternative designs which are typically roll off roof shed where the whole roof rolls off and uh, clamshell which is a hemispherical opening tend not to provide uh, as much protection against uh, extraneous light pollution uh, in addition uh, the wind is also a factor and uh, the, the narrow aperture tends to help with uh, any vibrations which you may get from uh, sort of weather conditions which we always see. So uh, without further ado let me see if I can share my screen and we'll jump straight into the first video where I will I've done this once before at least I will uh, show you around my observatory. How do I get rid of that? Let's just do with that. Hello, so we're outside. Uh, let's go and have a look at the observatory. So this is the observatory. It's a pulsar observatory. It's 2.1 meter fiberglass dome. Has a shutter aperture. Uh, let's go and take a look inside. Okay, so inside the dome, uh, let's take a little look at some of the equipment uh, that we've got inside. So first of all, the mount is an EQ6, Skywatcher EQ6 Pro. Uh, the mount's about 12 years old. It's uh, a fairly go-to setup for amateur astronomers. Uh, it's showing a bit of age uh, because it's based in an observatory you can see there's quite a bit of rust has appeared but that doesn't really affect its operation at all. Uh, on the mount we've got twin William Optics refractors so the one on the top is a 90 millimeter doublet it's a Megres 90 and the main imaging scope is a FLT 110 triplet uh, it's a very nice setup. Uh, it's particularly well suited for this particular observatory because of the uh, the way they're mounted on top of each other. They're piggybacked, 
uh, which is uh, which helps with the width of the aperture. So I chose this particular design because we have a lot of uh, ambient light pollution uh, in the very near neighbourhood. So there's a car park just here and there's a light in the car park which is uh, always on at night. So that helps to prevent any uh, light pollution from that and also if the moon is around it helps to shield um, and because of the narrow aperture, the positioning of the scopes means I get as much imaging time as possible without having to move the top of the dome around. Obviously this rotates in order to facilitate imaging. Now that's not automated. The reason that's not automated, there's a couple of reasons. First of all, it's extremely expensive. Secondly, this is an early model of uh, Pulsar Observatory's uh, domes and it is not designed for use with the kit that they currently produce so it would need quite a lot of customising in order for that to work. The cameras, the main imaging scope has a, well first of all there's a filter wheel there so it's a true tech super slim wheel with uh, five filters uh, so six filters and one dark filter position. So in terms of filters that are inside the wheel, I have a uh, full astronomic setup. So there's LRGB, hydrogen alpha, and oxygen three filters in the wheel. So underneath the filter wheel, this is a, this is a duvet filter that I use just to keep moisture off the the glass in front of the sensor. It's a SXVH9 mono, and on the other on the guide scope we have got a Starlight Load Star, the later model. So there's the Starlight Load Star X2. So I should just say that the field of view that I get with my main imaging setup through the FLT110 is 30 by 40 arc minutes, which is about the size of the full moon, so the full moon is 30 by 30. So it's about half a degree by half a degree. So in terms of power, I have some lights in here, which I use when I'm first setting up. There's a red and a white light. Uh, I have a power board down here and uh, that's wired into the garage on a separate circuit. Let's talk a bit about computing. Uh, this was the computer that I used to use to control everything. Uh, it's on a very old IBM ThinkPad. It's quite a capable machine. Um, reasons for upgrading, changing things. I didn't like uh, leaving the computer out here, uh, which was often the case. Sometimes uh, it would get quite wet uh, with the moisture and condensation. So I was recently upgraded or changed my setup. So this is the new computer that I'm using, which is a Raspberry Pi. So here's the case. The case is much bigger than the actual computer actually. Uh, and the reason I chose this particular case, there's no fan inside, so there's uh, heat sinks which contact this uh, aluminium surface and dissipate the heat. So it's a completely passive cooling uh, setup. So you can just see the computer, the main board is inside there. It only actually takes up about this much of the case. And then there's an access flap here, which you can remove, it's magnetic. That's in case you want to add uh, a breakout board uh, to enable the computer to perform other functions. Perhaps you would add a camera, so you would add a, an extra board there with cabling to support the camera. So as you can see, we have Ethernet. The Ethernet goes directly into the laptop and the laptop is 
solely used to as a screen so I can focus primarily and select targets and also monitor uh, what the system is doing. So that is just a, used as a screen for the Pi and that's over Ethernet so there's no latency involved. Then we have an additional Wi-Fi dongle to improve the range. I'm not quite sure how much improvement that provides but I was struggling with the built-in Wi-Fi so I added that on. The load starts going directly into a USB 3 and then the other connections are power and I have uh, a USB hub here and that's handling all of the other USB connections so we've got uh, both the cameras, the filter wheel and the mount going in here and then that goes directly into the Pi. And that's the basic setup so it's fairly neat and simple. Um, the main issue is the number of USB connections which have to be handled and that's there were some issues with compatibility with the Lodestar, so I broke that one out and put it directly into the Pi. But apart from that, this is uh, the setup that I'm using at the moment. A little bit more on the specifications of the Raspberry Pi that's inside the case. So the machine itself is a Pi 4 Model B. Uh, I think that's the latest one that's still available. The processor is a 1.5 GHz quad-core CPU and this model uh, is a 4 gigabyte RAM model. You can get it in 2, 4 or 8 versions. Uh, it supports dual HDMI output at 4K. It has gigabit Ethernet, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, two USB 3 sockets and two USB 2 sockets. It's £54 at the moment from the Pi Hut and there'll be links uh, for that. I purchased mine from Amazon. I uh, paid £90. It came with a different case which I've since upgraded. So the case actually, this case was about £30. Uh, it's a little bit specialised. It's called an Argon, Argon 1, if you're interested. Um, the kit that I bought comes with a 32 gigabyte, S gigabyte ST SD card even, which is uh, where all of the software is installed. And I think that's underneath here. I can't quite get a view of that, but um, the SD card contains all of the software, including the operating system. And of course, the power supply and cables and stuff like that come with the kit that I bought. And uh, I'd thoroughly recommend it. It's a great tool for learning programming as well as uh, little projects that you might want to uh, try to uh, set up and implement around your house and garden even. So in terms of operation, what I tend to do, and you'll see here, uh, a bit later on in the talk, uh, I will come out in the night, I will set everything up using the laptop as a screen. And uh, that's wired into the Pi, as I mentioned. And then I'll go back into the house and I'll monitor uh, the operation of the imaging run over Wi-Fi. The plan is to eventually wire in the Ethernet to the house, but we haven't quite got there yet. Uh, and that's uh, the basic setup. So while I'm out here, I'll have give you a quick look at the software. So what I'm doing now, I've just fired up the laptop and the laptop is set up to start up a browser on a page which links to the VNC via VNC rather to the, uh, the Pi. So this is the home screen of the Raspberry Pi that we're looking at now. And uh, this application is the, let me just get that reflection. So this application is the planetarium software, which comes bundled with uh, the software installation which I set it up with so we'll talk about that in a, uh, in a in a while it's called Astroberry and it's basically a suite of, app of software applications which work together to provide a a, uh, a full solution for a, for a home observatory uh, so this is the planetarium software it's 
contains everything that you would expect within a piece of planetarium software. So it has a database of objects which you can search. Obviously it's a fully zoomable interface. It also has this rather neat uh, ability to load a images from sky surveys so that you can see around objects and you can see in particular parts of objects that you're interested in imaging. So this helps a great deal when you're setting up an imaging run so you can focus on a particular part of an object and without having to uh, move, move the scope around too much and take images to find out where you are. It also has a very interesting or a very useful um, pointing. Let's just start it up. So we have to connect to the scope in order to see more of the features. So we're now connected and it has an excellent alignment uh, feature which enables you to accurately align on any part of the sky. And I'll do some screen captures of this um, later on in the talk. But basically you have different aspects. So you have a camera tab which enables you to interact with the camera and filters. You have a focusing tab which actually I don't use. So I did try to, to fit an autofocuser to uh, my main scope. It's actually this one down here. So I did try to fit this autofocuser. Uh, it didn't go too well. Actually, it ended up breaking my microfocus assembly, so I'm not using that. Uh, not sure if I did something wrong, but I just don't think that this particular scope is well suited to autofocusing, so uh, we abandoned that project. Uh, but there is a facility for autofocusing, you've got all of the settings here, and then there's guiding built in, so it has an inbuilt guiding feature and uh, obviously we'll make use of that um, on every imaging run. It has a scheduling uh, ability where you can schedule targets and then you can continue them over multiple nights of imaging and this is just a summary screen where you can see uh, latest images and gliding all in one place so this is a good overview screen but we'll do some screenshots and go into those in more depth a bit later right that's enough from me out here let's go back into the house right let me see if i can get the meeting back sorry i was uh don't know if you can hear me now stop sharing there we go can you hear me yeah all right great yeah i wanted to mute myself after i started that video then i realized i couldn't access the controls to do so so uh i'll try and do that before uh we play the next part but anyway so that was a a very quick sort of round trip of all of the equipment that i'm using um and a brief introduction to the pi and the software that i use to uh run things so um as i mentioned we will go back out at night in a few minutes and we'll we'll go through the the steps that i that i have to um perform it when i'm setting up a an imaging run uh and we will um have a a little look in more detail at the software how it works and yes apologies for the building noises thank you for for mentioning that i was i was running out of days nice days on which to film uh on which to film this so it's always a bit of a gamble as how late you leave it and i picked my moment and it just happened that the other the other, one of our neighbors had the builders working out the back of their house so sorry about the banging on that on that particular clip um so i think what we'll do now is uh we'll look at uh, an imaging run and we'll come back after that and we'll we'll have a brief discussion about um how i control things once i've set things up outside and some other aspects of the system which are also um quite relevant so i'm going to mute myself before we start this one let's see if i can do that
So here we go into the observatory. Let's put my bed down. Stick the light on. Let's see what we're doing. Right, first step. Open the shutter. Do this with the lens cap on, just in case anything drops from the roof there, drops of water or insects or whatnot. Next, I need to take these off. Just it easy with two hands. this on. You might have noticed the mount moved a bit there but that's not important. Put this into booting off because it's old. So now that's on the way up. I need to turn the flash off. So this is the Raspberry Pi, which we saw before, and this is the screen I'm using to interact with it, which is just a laptop connected with an Ethernet cable. The, I use the Ethernet cable because it eliminates any Wi-Fi latency going to the house and back again. So the first thing to do, now that we've got the roof open and the scope on, is connect to the scope and the cameras which you heard there the filter wheel we can check everything's connected with these green lights so everything's connected and we can just stow that screen that's a screen to manage the drivers for all the hardware so next I've been looking at uh, some targets while I was in the house so here we're pointing north. Let's move and see if we can find Cassiopeia. So let's look east and then we'll go up. Here's Cassiopeia. And I was looking at uh, the target and Cepheus. So one of the good things about the software that I'm using is it downloads an all sky image. As you zoom in it increases the resolution so it gives you a good idea of what any image may eventually look like. The This square the rectangle on the screen is actually my field of view with the camera and telescope combination that I'm using. Switch to my other hand so that I can centralise this target. You saw the image moving there because it's tracking the um, it's not tracking the sky at the moment so what I would like to do is centre on this star So when it's picked up a star, I can centre on that star, and that's framed up that uh, target quite nicely. So now I'm going to go to this screen, which is a, sh a scheduling screen, and I can type in my uh, image, my target name, And all I'm going to do is add the coordinates from the screen's centre. Into the scheduler. And there I've selected a, a sequence which will take two 10 minute exposures. One with hydrogen alpha and one with oxygen 3. And we're going to do 12 runs. So there's 24 images scheduled. 
on those particular coordinates. Now I'm not going to start that um, sequence just yet because I want to focus the telescope so let's do that let's just um, move to this nearby bright star we'll unpark and then we'll go to the scope should start moving but as it's moving obviously I can see because that star is near my target I get a good idea of where the dome needs to be, so let's move that round. Back a bit. And you can see there the weights are almost horizontal, so I'll probably be able to track for about an hour before I have to come out and uh, um, help it through its meridian flip which can be a, a little bit, um, which will always result in having to move the, the top of the dome. So, now we're here, let's turn the light off. And we'll take some images to focus. So first thing to do is, actually we'll do the alignment routine. So it's going to take an image uh, on with the luminance filter, which is here. It's just come in and it's going to uh, plate solve that image and adjust its uh, positioning to center the coordinates uh, of the bright star that we selected previously so it's, it's it's worked out where that image is in the night sky it's moved the telescope and tried to center the bright star taken another image which it's doing now and then it's repeating the process. So I've just heard it move very slightly. You should see the next image will come in there. Yeah. And the star is quite well centered. It'll probably be good enough. It may, may, may want to do one more. No, it's fine. So it's come back. You can see the error 17 arc seconds. And that didn't take uh, very long at all. So that's the plate solving aspect of this uh, piece of software very very useful so now we're on that star we can go to the camera and we will just uh, loop a three second hydrogen alpha images and I'll put the I know the star centered now so I'll put the Bartonov mask on not me on the scope so that Bartonov mask is just going on like so it's a little bit Tatty, sorry, let's see that. So the button off mask is on. Let's see what the image looks like. So these are three second images. And let's zoom in. So that one's a little bit shaky, but uh, we should get some steadier ones. And what we can see, what we're looking for. is this horizontal line should be halfway between the oblique diagonals and you can see it's too high so we need to adjust the focus so there's no real no way of knowing which way is the right, right way to go and it looks like I've chosen the right way and that looks pretty good to me so that's good enough. Okay, so that's half focused, and the next step is to start the scheduler, which we'll do now. That's good, and we will go to the scheduler. That's the last image coming in, and we'll just hit start. Let's see what happens. And now the telescope is plate solving on those coordinates. It is the yellow rectangle that you see that I'm just centering with the other field of view indicator and this is the image we should be acquiring so let's just go and see what's going on it's just finalizing its position so you can see it's just starting the guiding procedure which is on this tab and what it's doing is it's selecting selected automatically a guide star and now it's running through a calibration 
uh, procedure. Uh, once that's complete, you should hear the filter will uh, start. It will move to the hydrogen alpha, which is the first filter it will use, and then it will begin uh, the sequence alternating between hydrogen alpha and oxygen 3. So I'll just turn the light off and then I'll move the dome to ensure that I get as long as possible before I have to come outside again. So I'll just do that now. So here we are back inside in the warm. Brought my beer in as well. Um, this is the view of the pie in the observatory. So I'm just remoting in on my laptop. And again, this is just a view of the screen that the pie would display if it had a, a, a monitor connected, which it doesn't. So what we can see is the schedule is running. The first image is being acquired. So it's a 10 minute image. There's no image yet, but you'll see it there. This is the guide graph in the bottom right. It shows you the guiding errors. And this is the guide star that we can see being held still or being recentered by the software sending commands back to the mount. So we will come back in a few minutes when the first image comes in and I'll see you in a minute. Right, so that was just one image which um, I just showed for demonstration. I don't know if you saw, but there were some satellite trails going across it as well. Uh, so that is uh, the operation of the system, basically. The button off mask, which I didn't really show in the video, I ran out and got very muddy just now and pulled it from the dome. But that's what it looks like. And it's just an amazing piece of kit, which um, helps immensely with focusing. It's just incredible how it works and I don't know how the guy invented it but it, it is a stunning piece of kit and very simple as well but it works very well. So uh, we've looked at imaging, uh, we've looked at the equipment. Uh, another thing you have to do when imaging and I'm mindful of the time now it just seems to be disappearing is shoot flat so you have to calibrate your images. So I've got a very short video um, showing that it's only a couple of minutes and then we'll come back and I've got um, a, I was going to do a live processing uh, uh, sort of session. Uh, instead of doing it live, I, I, I wimped out and I recorded myself doing it this afternoon. I cut a few bits of, uh, of, the, of the boring stuff out. Uh, but I wanted to show, um, after we look at shooting flats, uh, a bit of how processing software works and in particular a piece of software um, called Astro Pixel Processor which is a huge time saver for me and um, I'll, we'll have a look at that after this one and uh, we'll run through a front to back process of uh, well, uh, of processing an image. So let's uh, move on to the next video and we'll be back shortly. It's only a short one, I promise. So uh, let's just mute myself and I'll be back in a few minutes. Okay, well it's the morning and we're going to go out and shoot some flats. Okay, so here we are back in the dome in the morning after doing some imaging. I'm going to shoot some flat frames. So the first thing to do is to take the, the cover off the main scope and put on a, a white piece of cloth to evenly illuminate the sensor. So let's do that and I'll be right back. Okay, so you can see I've put a piece of white cloth. It's actually a piece of an old white t-shirt on the end of the scope with some elasticated uh, cord around it. All that does is it provides an even field of illumination for the camera and the imaging train. And what we're going to do is we're going to take some images of the defects uh, in the imaging train, which includes dust and uh, optical defects as well such as coma so it doesn't matter if it's cloudy it is cloudy this morning as long as there's some light you can do this 
uh, with the dome closed as well by shining a light on the inside of the dome for example or you can use electroluminescent panels but I prefer this method it works fine so let's go ahead and set up and take some flats so here we are we're connected to the cameras uh, the mount is off we don't need the mount so I'm going to load up the sequence the sequence I'm going to use is for HA and O3 since that's what we were taking last night. It's set to a default exposure but you'll see as we start the sequence it warns me to cover the telescope with evenly with an evenly illuminated light source as we've done because it knows we're taking flats. So you hear the filter wheel changing. When the first frame comes in I'll turn on the statistics for the image and the idea is these numbers here should fall within a certain range so I set that range and what the software is doing is it's automatically adjusting the exposure so here at 0.17 seconds to to meet that requirement and you can see from the blue bar below that we're that we're taking exposures which do meet the requirement so I've set it to take 20 of each and we're already halfway done on the hydrogen alphas so you can see um, this is what my imaging train looks like it's not very pretty there are some dust motes on the lens there are there are dust motes on the CCD sensor glass but all of this can be processed out every now and then I will clean the optics but it's better not to clean optics too often generally so but they are due for a clean as you can see uh, that's the O3 filter and we'll just continue until we're done so as you can see the last few frames of oxygen 3 flat fields are coming in and this whole process generally takes between 5 and 10 minutes so it's quite painless but um, always good to shoot your flats as soon after your imaging session as possible because particularly if you have well if you have a permanently mounted instrument the focus position will change due to uh, fluctuations in temperature and humidity so uh, I try to do this uh, on the morning after the imaging run when possible right see you back inside Okay, so that was the that was the full uh, process of image acquisition. Basically, all of all of the things I have to do, where any imager has to do, basically when they're shooting targets. Uh, now, I did mention in the second video that we'd look at uh, how I monitor. So, after being outside and setting everything up, focusing, getting on a target, making sure the guiding started, I will close the laptop, eliminate all of the light sources inside the dome, come back to the into the house. And then I'll VNC uh, into the Pi over Wi-Fi. So, I mean, that connection works, but it's not brilliant. Um, it's good enough, basically, because there's not much changing on the screen. So uh, there's very small amounts of data that have to be transferred. But the other thing that's, that could be an issue is uh, file management. So uh, generally, uh, when you're running a an observatory you will have a computer which you'll either move in and out of the observatory or you'll leave in the observatory and then you've got the issue of how do you transfer the files um, and keep everything up to date so I found a piece of software which is excellent um, for this and it's called sync thing uh, basically it is a uh, free piece of software which allows you to um, connect or share files between systems and it uh, will keep uh, the uh, the, fo the folders synchronized between multiple systems and uh, basically I've set it up on the on the Pi because there's a Linux distribution and it's set up on two of the laptops in the house so all of my flat fields my docs if I take any I rarely take new docs and I've got a dark library and a bias library but the flats and the target files, as new files appear on the Pi, they are shipped over to the laptops in the house. So that, that completely eliminates um, any of the extra work that I have to do 
uh, from that aspect, which is very nice. Uh, it's a very good piece of software. It seems to work extremely well and it's free, um, which is great. Now, the last thing we were going to do, I was going to talk a bit about uh, software, processing software. So uh, those who image uh, will know, obviously, uh, the, 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 um, the sort of legacy applications such as Maxim, uh, Photoshop, um, that sort of pipeline where you're using multiple applications to uh, calibrate, stack, and then process. So uh, I wanted to try and avoid um, that kind of dependency upon multiple programs. So I started looking at Pix, Pix Insight, which is of course uh, one of the industry standards now. It's quite expensive, but they do give you uh, an extensive uh, free uh, demo period where it's fully featured for 45 days. It gives you a nice look, good opportunity to try out the software. But I must admit, I think I spent more time learning how to use it than actually using it. And I wanted to try um, and uh, find a piece of software which was simple enough for me to uh, front to back process an image in, in a relatively short period of time. So what I did was I found, uh, I, I was looking through reviews and I shortlisted um, two or three uh, pieces of software, some of which I just tried and I realized they weren't for me, but it came down to PixInsight or Astro Pixel Processor. So what I want to do is give you a run through of how the software works. And for this, uh, for this video, there's no sound. So I'll stay on and hopefully you can still hear me. Um, you might not be able to see the screen though. So just wait with me a second. Let me share my screen again. And this time I won't share the sound from the computer. Let's see if this works. If I start it playing while well, I can see some of you, perhaps you can indicate via a hand wave if you can still hear me. Len, I can see you. You're Okay, thank you. So, right, perfect. So here's the interface for a start. It's a very odd looking interface. I mean, most software doesn't look like this. There's no menus. So there's no menus uh, at the top. All of the um, controls are in this left uh, part of the screen. And what you have is a set of numbered tabs, one to nine. And you start at one and you work your way up the list. It's really quite intuitive. So all I'm doing at the moment is loading the light frames from uh, an image which I, uh, sorry, a target which I imaged back in July, I think. So I had a quite a long run on it over one night. I think it was about uh, four or five hours. Uh, and that simplifies the processing somewhat because uh, it means there's only one batch of uh, files to calibrate. So that's the reason why I've uh, chosen this particular one. So I've loaded up the actual image files at the bottom here, the light, the light frames, and now I'm loading the flat uh, files, which you saw me uh, similar to the ones that you saw me um, taking in that last clip. So we've got the HA loaded, and I made a mistake with the O3. I shot some binned and some unbinned, and I need the unbinned ones. So I only selected half of those. Um, and I'm telling it which session they belong to. So you can uh, process multiple sessions over multiple images taken over multiple nights by setting up uh, separate sessions in in this piece of software, which is a, a very nice feature. So this is a, a library of darks that I've got of, of different exposure lengths. So I've got 60, 180, 300 and 600, I think. The camera I use is quite quiet um, anyway, so it doesn't tend to have a lot of uh, sort of um, bright, bright pixels, hot pixels. Um, and these are bias frames. There is a lot of readout noise on the camera I use. So uh, I have to always calibrate with the bias. You should always calibrate with the bias anyway. And of course you can, you can build master uh, frames for all of this, which is a, uh, an option as well as you'll see as we're going through. So that should be all the calibration um all loaded up and then all we do yeah they i'm indicating that you can select masters and it will create the masters so if you have to repeat this process you can just select the masters this takes a little bit of time so i've cut through uh, i think it took about two two minutes or so to create all the master frames 
and there I'm saving the calibrated light frames if uh, we need to pick them up at a later date. And that's just save, saving them. So once that's completed, and that really is, uh, in, in a sense, the bulk of the work. So the, these frames are all now, uh, these are the frames that are loaded and then at the bottom of the list, we should find the calibrated hydrogen alpha. Oh, sorry, that's, that's a flat. So that's a master flat for hydrogen alpha. And yes, I'm ashamed of the state of my optics, but uh, this is what happens when you have a permanently mounted instrument. It's just impossible to keep everything free, uh, clean and dust free. That's the dark. So there you can see the hot pixels. There are not many of those for 10 minute images. And this is the bias. You can see the readout noise on the left side primarily and some at the top as well. So all of that is, is in every single image I take and it has to be subtracted. These are individual 10 minute, minute exposures. Uh, so those are oxygen three, the faint ones, and these are hydrogen. And you'll see the targets upside down because uh, in some of them, because the scope has performed a meridian flip and the optics are rotated 180 degrees on the target. But the software takes care of all of that. So the next step is uh, picking out stars in each of the images. And the reason why it's doing that is so that it can register the images on top of each other. Um, I, I dither my images. So each image, um, each separate image is actually on a different part of the sensor uh, by just a few pixels. And that means that you can't actually stack the images on top of each other without performing this process. So I've left this run in real time. It doesn't take very long at all. Uh, so we're just working out where those stars are in each image and then the next tab allows us to register the images together. So I think there's a reference image which is automatically uh, picked as part of this process, but you see that's almost instant. And there I'm just going to save the, I'm not going to save them, but you can save them. Uh, normalization, I believe this is a process for eliminating uh, background gradients. Again, this takes a few, well, a couple of minutes maximum. I think I've cut through this, but uh, it, in any event, it, it's quite rapid and it's totally automatic. You'll see that all of these settings on the left are not actually changing. These are the default settings. And there is, uh, I believe that's the oxygen. And this is the hydrogen alpha uh, with stacked images. So these are the mono images. Uh, I think there are 16 oxygen three 10 minute exposures and 17 hydrogen alpha. So what I can see there is the halos around the bright stars in the oxygen three. And I potentially would go back and try and process those out, but I'm not going to bother for the process of the demonstration. Um, you, you'll see with the final image, it's, it's difficult to discern them, but I know they're there. So uh, that's, that's a, an artifact produced by some of the processing routines to stretch the images. And the software is doing all of that automatically, which is really quite incredible. So the last part of the processing is to combine the images. So what you have to do here is you select uh, a formula you'll see on the left of the screen there, it says formula H001. So that implies we're going to put hydrogen, uh, the hydrogen alpha image in the red uh, part of the RGB um, spectrum and the oxygen into the uh, green and the blue. And this is the, the uh, first um, attempt that the, the, the software has made to combine the hydrogen and the oxygen images together. Now on the right of the screen, there's this uh, drop down, which is marked with a red question mark with that, that red question mark is a help screen, which explains what it's doing. But basically it allows you to quickly adjust the background brightness and the level of the stretch. So I'm experimenting, just picking some of the presets and I'm choosing a, a, a reasonable background shade. Uh, but what you can see is that it's, it's brought out the red a little bit too much. So I'm uh, increasing the mix of the hydrogen alpha luminance channel by, uh, by 5%, it was at zero. And I'm, I'm gonna call that good enough to, uh, to, to save and I wouldn't be embarrassed about sharing that image with anybody. And that um, process front to back uh, took 12 and a half minutes, which is astounding 
when um, we can when we consider the amount of time that I've spent uh, trying to get a similar effect using Maxim Photoshop, and uh, well, if you include the hours that I spent on PixInsight to learn how to start processing, then uh, it's a, an order of magnitude better. So all I'm doing here is I'm saving um, a JPEG version of the image with the stretch. So in the top right, the, the stretch box is limited. And you can see we're clipping pixels, but um, for me, uh, the, the speed of the, the processing pipeline is, um, is well worth the investment. So, so I, I, I pulled the trigger on Astro Pixel Processor basically uh, just based on the ease of use and the speed with which you can get results like that. So we're getting close to the end now. Um, I can't believe how quickly this has gone. I have got some other material to go through. Are we all right to carry on for a, a few more minutes? I know it's Friday night. but Yeah, that's fine. Uh, certainly fine with me, Ian. Uh, I'm sure we'd like to close off with, with what you know, you've got to say. That's not a problem. Okay, great. So, I mean, no one's going out, I don't think, uh, these days. But, uh, so let's, let's carry on. Uh, I have got some slides. I don't like slides, but I have got some slides. So we'll do a quick... Um, run through of what I've got and then we'll go through the chat. Somebody did ask a question. I uh, will come to that in a moment. So let's just, uh, you can see my screen? Yes, good. Uh, let's see if we've got the keynote running. Okay. So we, we've seen the observatory. That's not me, by the way. Um, so the observatory was installed in 2006. That's my boy there. Uh, and that's what it looked like it's, uh, back then. So just a few images, first of all. So uh, this was taken not from the back garden. Uh, this was taken actually in Hurst Monsoon in Sussex, which some of you uh, may have visited. It's a wonderful place to visit. I would certainly recommend it. And uh, for three nights of the year, I think it's usually in September, they have a, a wonderful... Um, so I can't see my mouse button now. I wonder if this will work. I can't actually admit that person who's... Uh, wait, let me just come out of this. Let's let you in. So it's, it's in September. They, they run a uh, astronomy festival, they call it, and you can camp in the car park. There are no camping facilities, but the skies down there are pristine. And uh, that's where this image was taken. It's quite an old one now. You may have seen it before, in fact, but uh, it's two pane mosaic. Uh, it's one of my favorites. It's the uh, Eastern Veil, vale, which is part of a supernova rem remnant in Cygnus. And it's a beautiful object. And this is another part of the same object. So also uh, uh, part of the Veil vale Nebula. So this is the uh, Western Veil, vale, which is also known as the Witch's Broom. It's very bright in oxygen three which is the blue portion that you can see there. It's a, a very nice filamentary detail in that uh, object. It's also a two-pane mosaic. This one was shot in Salisbury. This one was from my back garden, the M27, the dumbbell. And, uh, uh, and narrowband is obviously um, more achievable um, in our region, so where we're bathed in sort of sodium light from the M25. But, a uh, nice narrowband object and reasonably well framed uh, in my field of view. Quite a nice large object and a nice galaxy. I saw someone last month who gave the talk, I think mentioned just their favourite objects. One of my favourite galaxies as well. Uh, beautiful uh, face on spiral, the triangulum uh, galaxy M33 with some nice um, hydrogen alpha star formation regions as well. That one was uh, also taken in Salisbury. I can't really do galaxies from Rickmansworth. It's just too much, there's too much um, pollution. So here's the object actually uh, imaged in Salisbury uh, some years ago, um, just as a comparison. I suppose this had several hours of processing put into it from, from Photoshop. Um, stacking was, and calibration was done in Maxim. And you can see in this image the, uh, the oxygen three glow is much more apparent. But I'm sure given the, uh, given a little bit more time, I could go back. I think the, the, the reds in this are a little bit more washed out as well, but um, 
there's maybe some more oxygen data in here and I think the the sky certainly contributed the sky quality was a lot better in Salisbury but um, yeah, it's a nice image so let's talk a little bit more I, I did mention the specifications for the Pi it's a wonderful little piece of kit it's in, quite incredible that you can have a fully featured computer like that um, in, your, in the palm of your hand uh, but the the specs are listed here and there will be some links which I'll share with uh, Sean after the um, after the presentation and hopefully uh, some of you will be inspired to take a look because it's not just for astronomy of course there's a multitude of projects that you can use these things for I'm sure some of you may already be doing so now <clears throat> in terms of software Astro Berry was the software suite so that's a pre-built image which you can download onto an SD card pop it into the Pi boot it up and it will actually it will actually be already loaded pre-configured ready for you to use it's quite astounding actually that you can just put an SD card into the uh, machine start it up and it's there uh, it's down to you to configure it and set it up of course um, what's actually included is uh, KSTARS, which is the planetarium software, ECOS, which is a part of KSTARS, and that's the screens that you saw when we were controlling uh, the cameras, the telescope, um, and also the guiding routines. That's all in the ECOS uh, package, which is part of it. Cost to seal is also included. I haven't even tried to use it because KSTARS does everything I want it to do. It's got databases. It's, it seems to have everything. Um, the Indie framework is the drivers. It's a, it's a large set of drivers and there's some links. If you want to check and see if your hardware is supported, there's the, uh, the web uh, site is quite uh, fully featured and lists all manner of hardware. PhD2 is also part of it, but I haven't even looked at it. I use the ECOS guiding, as you saw. It seems to work fine. And the plate solving, there are three different ways to plate solve. So you can download the um, you can download the databases, the, the star databases that you need, and then you can work offline, which is what I prefer. It's slightly quicker. Uh, you can, if you have a good internet connection, then you can run it online, which needs le less space from your card. Um, but there's also an, an entirely separate um, uh, astrometrical uh, plate solving routine uh, known as ASTAP, which I have actually had running, but I tend to stick with astrometry.net. Uh, and also there's other applications for planetary imaging, which I haven't looked at. And um, on, the, on the subject of planetary, of course, you're looking at a lot of disk space for imaging. Uh, uh, sort of running movies at large at high frame rates so I would suggest then you can just plug in a an external drive into the Pi quite easy to do uh, here are the links I'll share those and just before we close off I will go to the minor planets website minor planet center minor planet center is the clearinghouse for all um astrometrical observations globally so it's based in uh the international Astro astronomical union in in uh, massachusetts cambridge massachusetts uh which is near boston in the us and as sean mentioned before uh i started there is a uh, project that you can undertake if you have a CCD camera. I think you can even use a DSLR. I saw some information about imaging with DSLR to obtain astrometrical readings, but uh, I undertook this uh, this program of astrometry. I did give a talk about it some time ago. I've given it elsewhere as well, and uh, other people have actually contacted me several months down the line to say that they'd done the same thing. Uh, the goal is to uh, perform astrometrical reduction on uh, a series of images to obtain uh, positioning of uh, asteroids basically you can do it with comets as well but there's not so many comets around there's a large number of asteroids around and uh, the information if you would be interested in undertaking that program of astrometry is here and uh, what's the goal why would you do it well there's not many people who've actually done it so if we look at the list of uh, this is a uh, an up-to-date list of uh, the codes which are 
assigned by the uh, MPC worldwide. Let's go to the top. Who's at the top? It's Greenwich, of course, at zero longitude. So that's top of the list. And if you go through, there's several, um, yes, Hubble Space Telescopes even in there, but all of the big observatories are listed. And if we search for, I think, if we search for Rickmansworth, you can see uh, this is me, I-97 Heights Observatory. So that was the goal. I think there's about two and a half thousand observatories listed, including all the space observatories. So it's a, it's a fairly exclusive list and it's a very interesting program. If anybody's interested, then just uh, reach out. Um, I can, I can help you through, but loads of information here if you want to, if you want to get started. Uh, and I think that's about where I wanted to get to. So let's have a look at the question. Somebody mentioned a different uh, piece of software, Nina. So I haven't heard of Nina. Uh, I don't know what it does. Where's the chat gone? How do I get that back? Anyone Should know? be at the bottom of the screen. Let's have a look. I bring Zoom up first of all. No. No, I'm on a Mac, so they they like to do things differently, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, let, I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, oh, here it is. Yeah, it came back when I stopped sharing. There you go. Yeah, Alt H is a shortcut. Yeah. So, have you seen Nina open source software? I haven't. I haven't actually seen it. I don't know what it does, so I can't compare it. But there is a lot of open source software out there. I mean, even the company I'm with now, I just joined them a month or so ago, and we're all of our software is open source. All of the libraries we use is open source. Um, the good things about open source software is the, the, the parts of it that are used commonly are very well supported. The parts that are not used so commonly are not so well supported. And I found that with my filter wheel, the drivers didn't work. Uh, I got a bit frustrated, but I actually reached out to one of the chaps um, via a forum uh, a, a chap in Kuwait actually who is um, uh, he, he runs the Stellamate projects he might want to look up Stellamate as well and he helped me uh, he, he uh, showed me the code and I had a look through the code he fixed uh, the issue actually and um, um, managed to get me an updated version of the driver so it was subsequently broke and I was able to fix it myself by recompiling the, the code that he had shared with me. But uh, that sort of thing certainly helps if you're going to take on a project like this. So, yeah. And there's another question from Peter. Uh, my view on the Raspberry Pi. Well, I, I think it's a, uh, it's a fantastic piece of kit. Uh, it's not very expensive. So if you want to buy it without a case, without a power supply, without cabling, you can. And it's, um, it looks it looks too good to be true, but if you do buy if you do buy it that way, I think it will only set you back about forty pounds. And you, you can even buy the older versions if you know that the project that you're going to be using it for is not going to be too demanding on to, in terms of processing. I just bought the best one that was currently available. Uh, the price uh, was ninety pounds, I think, with with a simple case, with a power supply. Uh, with a couple of uh, HDMI cables, which helped when I was setting it up, of course. Um, and what I would say is if you're interested in uh, computing or coding, it's a fantastic way to get started because it is, it is a computer in your pocket, basically. And there's all, all manner of applications. Someone I used to work with was using one to run his uh, garden watering system. Uh, yeah. So uh, and it also had cameras, which were, uh, I think were accessible um, remotely. I think maybe the Pi was doing that as well. So uh, all manner of applications and very affordable. And, you know, if your kids are interested in computing, it's a great way for them to understand that computers really are just all about commands and, and, and programs. And it's a good way to, to, to get down to the the operating system level as well without having uh, too much between you and what the computer's doing. So yeah, definitely recommend it. My dome was uh, a question about my dome and the cost. So if I remember rightly, I think it was uh, £2,100 installed. But that, I'm not sure if that included the peer. The peer was quite expensive. Um, 
Pulsar Observatories. This was one of their their first uh, second iteration domes. So they, they did two flavors, 1.9 meter and 2.1 meter. And they've since completely redesigned it. So I don't think there's many like mine around, but it's certainly done well. It's I, I checked and it's uh, 14 years now. I think it's guaranteed for 20. So they I think they knew what they were doing when they were manufacturing it. It really is a um, a well-made product and it's it stood the test of time. I think there's at least another 10 years in it. Um, but yeah, I've got no, uh, in terms of automation, it would be nice to automate the rotation. They sell a kit for that, for their new version, but it's, it, it's, it's too expensive to, be, to warrant not going down to the bottom of the garden once or twice an hour to, to, to rotate the dome. That's really all I have to do. Uh, it's the, the automation kit is really for remote observatories only. So, uh, I would suggest, um, you don't need, you don't need to automate your observatory to that degree. I did try the focusing, the focusing didn't work for me. Um, so I have that piece of kit, but, uh, I won't be fitting it to my current scope. It just didn't. I think it was turning the 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 focus adjuster much too quickly for its liking. It was designed to be a manual adjustment, and really, there's a very little, small amount of tweaking. And even when it was installed and working, I couldn't get it to perform better than uh, the button off mask and manual adjustment. So, from that respect, um, it wasn't worth it. It was a an interesting uh, foray into auto focusing, but I don't think it's worth it if you have. Uh, a, a, an observatory which is close to your house let's say um, so yes that's it from me basically one thing I will mention um, is uh, Simon Kidd who is next month's speaker he is uh, I have looked at occultation occultation as Sean uh, rightly uh, stated is uh, measuring uh, the timing largely of uh, shadows caused by asteroids passing in front of stars it's, it's incredible um but over very short time scales you might have an occultation of perhaps just a few seconds maybe even less than a second but it can um it can tell you a great deal about the um the orbiting body so the asteroid in, including its shape its rotation um, and when you have many people doing this on the same object uh, you can build up a very interesting uh, series of uh, scientific results and this is actually somewhere where the amateurs really do provide a lot of uh, scientific input is in occultation so i i'm a part of the occultation group so i see simon kidd's name quite a lot so when sean mentioned that he's uh, giving next month's talk i uh, i thoroughly recommend uh, attending and i'll be there for that one but that's it from me so any other any other questions please drop them into the chat otherwise uh, i hope you enjoyed it and uh, i'll see you soon hopefully well, thanks very much, Ian. Um, on behalf of everybody, because everybody's muted, thank you very much. And um, maybe we'll have a quick chat at the end with everybody. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Richard, who's going to give us uh, a, a quick up uh, view of the planetarium uh, for the sky for the month upcoming. Again, if you have any further questions, you know, do let us know and we'll, we'll try and get them answered. And we'll share the information that Ian had um, on the screen. Um, and we'll hopefully also be able to do the video. Uh, so um, for the moment, I'm now going to uh, pass over to uh, Richard to make uh, Richard uh, share his planetarium view. Thanks, Sean. Okay. Ah, uh, now. There we go. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Straight. Yes, can you? Uh, okay, we're there. Okay, well, this is the sky for um, this particular this particular evening. It's a small segment of it. Um, you can see the square Pegasus here. You can see this blur here, which is actually the moon, and Mars, which is here. Now, but before I begin talking, last um, Friday morning at half past seven, Jan and I left home to go to. Um, Hampshire, we went to the, the uh, mid Hans Railway and later on Jan went to the next day, Jan went to Marwell Zoo and I carried on back to the railway. On leaving the house, I happened to look up and I saw bright light of, of um, 
Venus in the sky, which reminds us that there are other terrestrial planets rather than other than Mars that are in the sky. Um, so of course, low talking about Mars, there, as I say, Venus is still quite prevalent, bright, quite bright in the in the morning sky. Now, coming on to the subject of Mars, I've been observing it quite regularly, uh, particularly we've had several clear nights in, in succession, particularly at the early part of, of, um, of uh, October and later, later this week. Uh, one of the things that um, I hoped to see was some detail and um, or some planetary kind of, you know, some kind of features. Um, but I must admit that although I could see them earlier in, in September and into early October, Mars seems to have gone into a bit of a, I don't know if there's a dust storm, I haven't been able to find out, and I'm a bit frustrated because I'm not sure whether it's whether it's my eyes going or the telescope's going, um, but um, I certainly can't see as much detail at the moment. Um, remember that Mars is quite a small planet. Last month I compared it to the um, the variable, the um, double star Alberio, which has a separation of about 20, 28, 20 between 25 and 28 seconds of arc, and that is about the size of the disk of Mars in your telescope. So you need a high power to observe it anyway, um, and you don't tend to see a lot of detail visually, and I, although it's nice, it's brilliant to see these, these landscapes produced by people using webcams and other things, there's a lot of work to do that, and they're brilliant. But sometimes it's good just to look up and actually see it with your eyeballs that there is something there and you can see the polar cap. Um, but um, Mars is, of course, slowly moving away from us now. Or rather, we're pulling away from it in our faster orbit. So Mars will be getting smaller and dimmer as the, um, as the month progresses. And it, it will go from about second magnitude down, down to first magnitude, one first magnitude sorry yeah, over the next month so it's, a, it's actually it's actually going from a plus magnitude to to very nearly a minus so it's going to get quite it's going to get smaller and dimmer but on the other hand maybe the dimness will help because the disc is so blindingly bright in a telescope that you can't really see a lot of detail and that i think may may also contribute to the fact that i can't see much of the features of mars However, there are other things in the sky besides planets. It seems hard to believe sometimes, but there are. And uh, one of the things that I've, that I've mentioned in the newsletter is a kind of circular trip that I've done um, regarding looking at objects in this area here. The area that Mars is in has actually got quite a lot of other objects. And because you've got a focus of a bright orange light in the sky, it's worth looking at some of these other things as well. Now, in September, I pointed out how you can use star, these stars here to find um, M15. M15 is a globular cluster in Pegasus, and this is the neck of Pegasus, because Pegasus is actually upside down. His hoofs are up here somewhere, and his, and his neck is here. Seems strange to me, but there we are. I don't know many flying horses, so I can't really comment. Um, however, M15 is a very nice um, example of a, of a globular cluster. Strange enough, in September, at the, one of the meet one of the meetings of the virtual astronomy group, um, we were looking at an, an image of the of the uh, Andromeda spiral um, taken by a remote object, the remote um, telescope in um, in Spain near Seville. And somebody said, wouldn't it be nice if we could look at something else? So I suggested, well, how about moving the scope along and having a look at M15? And how cool is this? I'm sitting on my, in my back room on a computer, and here I am directing a guy who is living in Letchworth to look at an object in Spain, and it happens to be a globular cluster that I'm particularly fond of. I prefer visual astronomy, but it's really nice to see the globular cluster come out in... in um, in force as well and come out nice and bright um, on your screen when you don't have to put a coat on and sort of mess around with eyepieces. Now I'm going to use something I wouldn't normally use. I'm going to use the diagrams and the, let's turn that off and try this one. Yes, there we are. 
What I wanted to point out was there are other, as we say, there are, as we, you see, there are other objects to look at other than um, Mars and bright objects. And this little area here is the so-called water jar of Aquarius. It's a small, what we call an asterism because Aquarius kind of has this long straggling shape. It's supposed to be a man carrying a water jar, but I'm afraid the water jar is the only bit you can really, un really see. And it's quite easy to find because you just need to use this V here of um, Pegasus, Enif, which is the star there, and this one here, which I can't remember the name of, um, to actually pinpoint it. Come straight down with your scope and you come to this little area here of stars. It's quite obvious in a, in a small, in the finder of a small scope. But if you use these two stars and bring your scope over to here, you'll find another globular cluster that was discovered well, it was found, although it had been found before, it was actually discovered by Messier, but it was actually seen first by a guy called Moraldi some years before. But he claimed that he discovered it because he didn't know about the other previous finding. Um, and it's a very nice cluster indeed. Um, it's not the same as, as the, the one in Pegasus. It has a much less condensed core. It's, it's pretty evenly, evenly star-filled globular cluster. And that, of course, is M2. But there are other things even beyond that. The actual, this little group here, the water jar, that star there, which is Zeta, actually is a double star. And it's a very nice one, but it needs a high power on your telescope. And if you get to use a high power, you'll actually see that it's two cream colored stars close together. There's something, as I said in the newsletter, there's something about, um, refractors that do that to actually provide really good images of, of, of double stars and that is a particularly nice one to look at. Now also when we come across from here we run into the circlet of, of Pisces. Now this I must admit is hard to find visually but if you use your finder you will find if you use the stars of Pegasus here you will find that it points, if you make a, a, a triangle, it will actually come to the, this, this circlet. Located in the circlet is a star sometimes called 19 Piscium and sometimes TX um, Piscium. And that is a carbon star, it's a very red star. Um, the characteristic of them is that they're, they're pretty cool and they have, and they have um, molecular bands in them. So actually there is water vapor in that star. Um, the reason that they, that they are redder than a normal M-type star of that kind is the fact that they have carbon in their atmospheres and that acts as a filter so that the star actually appears redder than its spectral type would necessarily, would necessarily um, show. So that's, that's an example of something that's nice and bright and coloured. Um, now where the moon is, we have, of course, pretty bright area at the moment, and you won't be able to see the object. I'm just going to point out very easily. This is Ares. This is Aries, Ares. Um, it's three stars in a sort of a triangle. And between these two stars, there is, now make a triangle, you will come to the planet um, Uranus. Now Uranus is located about here at the moment. Um, it's not difficult to find. I've managed to find it with the with the 90 mil refractor reasonably easily, but then it is about between fifth and sixth magnitude, and it's round opposition at the moment, so it's not difficult to see. The only thing I would say is that it's small, although it doesn't look like a star. Yeah, you can tell obviously there's some size to it, and it doesn't have that kind of that that minute point of light that stars have. It doesn't, it, it really doesn't look like a star at all. Even when you're focusing, it doesn't behave that way. But this business about it being green, um, well, I'd say I've got fairly good color vision, although it's probably biased towards the red, but I can't actually see any trace of green at all. To me, it looks a kind of steely, maybe gray, a steely gray color, but it's definitely nothing like a star and it's worth finding and remembering how William Herschel on that night in March 1781 managed to find it and what thought he found a comet. 
um, and even imagined that it was getting bigger as he looked. Uh, of course, it wasn't. It remained the same size, but it showed how somebody even as clever as him could get um, uh, confused because he thought it was a comet and couldn't possibly imagine that it would be another planet. There's also a couple of interesting clusters as well. Now, this is the star Algol, which, as we know, is the is the the prototype eclipsing variable, and discovered the variability was how it worked was, was first described by John Goodrich in the 18th century, the very clever, dumb, uh, deaf mute that um, only lived to 21. But before he died, he managed to show how this was an obscuring body that was actually the two stars were mutually eclipsing each other. And it's between that and um, this star here, which is Gamma Andromeda, which I've pointed out many times before, is a very attractive yellow-blue double star. But between them, there's a little cluster that would be that is made for binoculars and very small telescopes, and that is M34. M34 in Messier's catalogue is a bright misty patch with some little twinkly stars in it, seen through binoculars. And if you use a telescope, you can actually see um, the, the some that some of the stars are actually double stars within that, making quite a nice group. In a telescope bigger than about eight inches, you can't really see much more. There isn't, it's not, in other words, a cluster that's got a lot of faint stars in it. It's bright blue-white stars or white stars. And it, it's, but it's an attractive sight nonetheless in a small scope or pair of binoculars. And if you have a look down here around the, the, this area here, just below um, Gamma Andromeda, you'll find that there's an interesting um, NGC cluster here, uh, 752, which is actually composed of a faint mist of stars and uh, again another one, another one of the bright star um, that actually is a double in that little group. And um, they, that is an older cluster than M34 because it's actually, um, it's actually more straggly and it's also, some of the stars are predominantly yellow. Uh, so it is it's definitely an older cluster. So you can compare these two and you can do all this in a what, small area of sky here. And that's just a few of the things that we that we can see. And they are they are easy to see. And, and I've seen them recently. Uh, that's why I'm, that's why I wanted to concentrate on, on them this evening. But of course, being October, we're now seeing the, the Pleiades coming up, which is, of course, a very, very good um, Harbinger of, of autumn and winter, and uh, binoculars do a very good job on on that particular part of the sky, and reveal a lot more of the stars in in other than the seven sister beyond the seven sisters. One of the things I've noticed about it, which I first discovered in binoculars in the 1970s, was the little hockey stick asterism of several stars that form a line with one off to the side that's in the, in the um, southeastern part of the cluster. That's just a little asterism within the group that's quite noticeable. Um, that's, so that's quite a few things to, um, to have a look at. And they're all, as I say, within an easy reach of, of the square of Pegasus, so can't get lost. And um, they're, 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 I've seen them recently, and that's something else because the skies are getting worse in terms of um, uh, light pollution. There's no doubt that it's, that it's something that's really getting bad. And, and yet they can all be seen with a really quite a small instrument. And well, you know, they're, they're, it's good to have a look and see these things, even though scientifically there's no real use to it. Incidentally, just before I finish, I'd like to say that in the same field as, um, as Mars, there has been a rather, rather large, um, a rather wide apart double star. I don't know what it is. I've looked it up and as far as I can tell, it's a star called 80 Pisium, but I haven't been able to find out any more information. But if anyone, anyone's been observing the Mar Mars um, using a small telescope visually, they would have seen that. And it's, it's just an attractive thing. And also a little help it helps you to focus on the image of Mars because the planets are difficult to focus on with a telescope, um, particularly Mars because it's, it's bright and it glares. 
and Jupiter because, and Saturn because of the or Jupiter particularly because of its its much softer um, limb. So uh, anything like that is useful to focus up on. So apart from anything else, that's something you can you can actually use to improve your Mars observations if you want to do that. So um, I'm going to hand back now to Sean. I hope that's that's um, enough information for one evening and uh, we'll come back and have a look at some more next month but uh, good observing great uh, thank you very much for that 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 was really good and um if you can uh, i i might actually try and just show a few little things um okay so uh, i might not be able to do this no, I won't be able to do it, but this, a plan, uh, the planetarium software that we're using here is Stellarium. You can download it for yourself if you haven't already done it. And there's a couple of really neat uh, shortcuts that you can use to find things. So, for example, there, when Richard was talking about uh, M2, um, if, you've, if you push, position your cursor in that general area, you'll find that M2 will come up and you can actually show it by uh, selecting some of the icons on the bottom of the screen to show deep sky objects. But then a very useful tool is to press the space bar and then you can use your scroll button on the mouse to zoom in and you can really get close into it and see an actual image of the object, which is very useful. Um, and one of the other things, if you don't press the space bar before you scroll in, if you really have a high magnification, you'll see the sky whizzing past you. So um, have an explore with it because it's a very good piece of software and, um, you know, it, it'll uh, help you learn the night sky as well. So I want yes. to thank everybody. Sorry, yeah, sorry. yeah I, was, I was just going to say, yeah, um, I'm still fiddling around with it at the moment. The, the instructions are rather dense for using it. So, I, I, so I'm, I'm slowly getting used to it. And there are a lot more things that you can do. I just want to just we wish I could improve the moon a little bit. That fuzzy blob <laughs> is a little bit, oh, that just doesn't, it's a bit like the planetarium at Rick, Ricky. If you put the moon on, you can't see much else because it's going to blot everything else out. So maybe there's, there could be all sorts of things in it. And I hope I'm trying to spend some time to sort that out. But um, so far, um, it's good. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks, Sean. Well, yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Really appreciate it. And uh, also welcome your feedback, uh, things that we're not doing right, how we can correct them and so on. So, yeah, just uh, thanks again. Sean, before you go, yeah. in Stellarium, if you um, um, on the left hand side, there's a magnifying glass. Yeah, you can tap on that, put in the name you want and it will take you to it. That's right, the search search window, yeah, that's it, good. Yeah, good, useful tip. And Richard, I, I managed to see um, Uranus last year in its sort of true bluey green colour through my nine and a quarter inch celestial. Ah, yes. Yes, it, I, I'm pretty sure that aperture comes into it. It must do. But, I, but the thing is, everybody, we, we're told that this is, you know, so it's one of these things where, yes, it can, but you do need a large aperture. I must admit, I could see very little colour through the eight and a quarter inch that I was using. That would be maybe slightly bluish, but yeah, it's, um, it, it's, it's, quite, it's quite subtle. Um, yeah, and blue-green is one of these parts of the visual, uh, the, the retina. that it, every, Some people have a bias. Mine isn't towards the, the blue-green. It's a, it's a very good article in the in the Society of the History of Astronomy on double star colours and their observers and how and how several of them were actually colour blind that wrote their their texts. So if anybody if anybody wants to have, have a read of it, it's quite it's a good article, and it goes into scotopic vision and forbial bit all the things that you need to know. Yeah, it's it's good. Anyway, thanks, Pat. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that. And. Uh... I, I see Stephen's wearing a, a very nice uh, piece of headgear right now. Oh, very <laughs> so, good. <laughs> but again, I want to thank Ian for the talk. Uh, it's the first time I've ever seen a talk go from end to end, covering all, all the bases. And, um, you know, it takes years to learn how to do this astroimaging business properly. And he made it look very easy. So thanks again, Ian. You're more than welcome. Yeah, it you. was my pleasure. Thank you again. It was brilliant.
Cheers. Thank you. All right. And with that, I'll close the meeting. So see you next time. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Bye. Cheers. Thanks. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Bye.